All right. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, we are in the car, in our chase vehicle. Uh, I'm at a little bit of an awkward angle here, but um, so far, no word from Overlook Horizon 10. Um, we're kind of hanging out, driving around to see, just to see if I could hear any APRS chirps, um, see if I could hear any packets or anything to get close to where I would think it would be. Don't get excited by that sound because that's not it. That's my uh, chase vehicle. Um, but so far at the moment, no word from Overlook Horizon 10 uh, on what seemed to be a very successful flight up until that point, which is unfortunate. So uh, if you're just joining for the first time, uh, we had liftoff at 4 o'clock Eastern time today. Uh, went well. We passed through the coldest part of the atmosphere that, um, that we measured, which was one of the main concerns, um, was whether or not the batteries could survive past that very... I made it like a weird sun angle here. But whether or not the uh, batteries could survive um, through the, the really cold temperatures, it passed through that and did survive. Traveled all the way up to about 64,000 feet. We got an early burst at 64,000, expecting 75,000, but burst pretty early. And uh, we got one packet after the burst, which is about 63,000 feet. And uh, since then, we've had nothing, which is unfortunate. Uh, I thought everything was going well. I was actually feeling pretty good about the flight. I thought things were going to wrap up. I was getting ready to go chase it down. I thought the hardest part was going to be the the uh, the recovery, you know, as far as like the tr figuring out how to get it out of whatever spot it landed in. Um, but it looks like our snag here was uh, something that occurred right at balloon burst. Um, I don't know what that might have been at the moment, but... Uh, yeah, right now, unfortunately, there's just no, no word from it. I'm sitting at the last known location, but it wouldn't have come straight down. It would have kind of loop around. Um, it was going to do another U-turn and head back, um, head back e uh, west of where I am now. So. So yeah, we didn't. Uh, we've got nothing, nothing that we've heard so far. So and there's no backup system on this flight because it was just that micro payload, just that tiny little piece. The so our only backup really is there is a label on it with our phone number, um, and that's about it. Uh, that's really the backup system there. Um, no word really on what what might have went wrong there. Um, the uh, so Michael says bummer. Where did you lose it? So we lost it um, about sixty four thousand or sixty three thousand feet. We got one chirp after the balloon burst, and then uh, we lost it. It would have been about uh, I don't know a mile or two north of our launch site because the the flight pattern had it going around in this crazy figure eight pattern, um, and so it had finished the bottom of the figure eight and was it was actually like basically right at the cross in the middle of the eight. Um, burst and then was supposed to complete the top of the figure eight but uh, never we got like I said one signal after burst and then nothing nothing after that so that's a bit unfortunate and I've been driving around here a little bit I mean uh, didn't really have high hopes I mean, once we once we lost it um, you know that's pretty much the end of it there's no there's no backup system to actually kick in here um you know the weird thing is you know we got a temperature reading right before last temperature reading we got was uh negative 49 degrees fahrenheit which is super cold and below the minimum operating temperatures of the batteries that they're rated to go down to negative 40 degrees our last reading was negative 49 which could be expected on the drop it does get super cold because um, you get a lot of that evaporative cooling going on as it's 
falling rapidly through the atmosphere. So certainly possible that the batteries didn't survive that. Um, we did have nine GPS satellites, so the GPS system was operating fantastically. Um, pressure was 62 millibars, humidity was 7%. Battery was running at 3.87 volts at the time, which is plenty of battery to service the, the system. So it is a little bit mysterious that it just cut out like that and never heard from it again. Um, yeah, a little bit mysterious. I kind of hope somebody, uh, Andrew says, I hope someone finds it. Yeah, I hope someone finds it too, really, so I can figure out what went wrong. I mean, we really just got nothing, just completely went out of communication after that last, uh, that last transmission there. So, that's uh, likely going to mean the end of that mission because I really have no, we have, like I said, we've got no backup systems in place to try to locate it. Um, other than the fact that, like I said, it has a label on it and maybe somebody will find it. So um, I hope so. That would be nice because I would like to know what went wrong or what happened. Um, yeah, because my biggest, my I guess my theory at the moment is surrounding the batteries. Um, you know, that super cold temperature, maybe they completely failed, but then again, I would think, I would, I would expect to see a drop, a lower drop in voltage before they failed, um, you know, and see like it teetering on failure, although it's possible that it just super cooled really fast and then we just didn't get a transmission. Um, before they failed. So it's certainly possible that it was the batteries that failed in the cold weather. Um, there's, a, there's some other minor possibilities, like maybe the battery contacts contracted and they just weren't, you know, in the cold temperatures, they just weren't making a connection. It's also possible that maybe in the, uh, the crazy activities that happened after balloon burst and it was tumbling down, the antenna was just basically a wire antenna um, it's possible that whipped around so much that maybe it broke off and the, the antenna that just, I mean, it's basically just a piece of wire. Um, possible that the antenna broke off and maybe it continued to broadcast, but it just has nowhere to go because without that antenna, it really has very, very limited range. Um, so I, I suppose it could be the antenna because the antenna is, you know, it's one thing that kind of sticks off the board that that would certainly flap around on the way down. Um, so those are my, those are my uh, suspected elements at the moment. Are really, uh, you know, either the end, the batteries, battery died, or may, I'm putting them on my stand here because I'm going to start moving. So um, yeah, either the battery died or the. Um, or the antenna broke off. I guess that's really my only uh, my only thoughts on what could have caused it to just completely die like that. I like guess it is it is surprising. I suppose we could turn this down a little bit. Um, surprising that it just cut off and just had nothing. So hashtag space octopus got the hashtag space shrimp. Yep, something definitely gobbled up the hashtag space shrimp today. Um, so this one is lost, at least at the moment. Still a chance somebody could find it. I'm, I would love to see somebody find it, although it's kind of cold out, so not a lot of people outside. Maybe somebody will find it in the coming weeks. Certainly possible. Uh, you know, not unheard of for somebody to find a payload weeks and weeks later. Um, it does have, um, the, the board has conformal coating, which is like a silicone spray coating on it. Oh, that sun is super bright and right in my eyes. Um, I'm just I'm driving to one more place that I wanted to at least let my antenna listen for maybe a weak signal. Uh, I don't really have any high hopes, but I'm going to go over there just in case. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's a little bit of conformal coating, which is that spray-on silico uh, silicone coating. And uh, it does protect the board from some minor moisture issues. Now, this is the first time I've used that conformal coating. Um, 
And so I don't know how well it's going to work or even how well I applied it for that matter. So I may have not applied it that well, but what I'm getting at is it, it's possible that even out in the weather conditions for a couple of days, it could potentially survive and be perfectly fine. Um, you know, it should be protected from moisture and corrosion at least a little bit. I don't know how well that'll hold up um, with that conformal coating. Like I said, I don't. Th that's the idea of the conformal coating. Is it's supposed to be for applications that are in high moisture environments? You, you put it, either dip the circuit boards in it or spray it on the circuit boards, and it protects the circuit boards from corrosion in high moisture environments. So, um, a lot of like industrial uses use that kind of stuff. But we've got it on our circuit boards for. Uh, well, for two reasons. One, it was in case the uh, in case it encountered moisture in the middle of the flight. I didn't want things to get shorted out or uh, something like that while I was flying. Um, but also, if it um, if it landed like it has at the moment. I mean, because it's on the ground at this point. 6:30. We definitely got a balloon burst, so we saw that event. So there's no question as to what altitude we hit. So it's definitely on the ground now. Would have landed, uh, I'd have to run some numbers to figure out for sure, but it would have landed somewhere around uh, like 5.45 to 6 o'clock Eastern time, somewhere in there. So it's been on the ground now for, um, for at least probably 45 minutes to a half an hour. Um, so at this point, it's not gonna light up in the sky anymore at least. Um, but it may, if it was the batteries that died, it could potentially come up, um, it could light up on the ground, um, but that conformal coating would hopefully protect it if it landed in a snowbank or if it had to endure uh, rain or snow for a couple of days while somebody was going to locate it, that conformal coating should protect it from that, but I don't know how, I don't know how well that stuff works or what the intended lifespan of that is. Is it going to protect it for a couple days? Will it protect it for a couple months? Are we talking a couple years? I have no idea. So that's the, uh, uh, there's a potential for it to be salvaged, even if it was lost for a couple of days. Um, and uh, let's see, what I was going to say something else too. Um, I don't remember now. I can't remember what I was going to say. There was something I had in the queue for after that, but I don't remember. So, um, so yeah, we, we could potentially salvage. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, the, the big concern, or well, the whole, the, the big concern really is that it's lost, right? Um, but the, the issue, I suppose, that, that you'd run into if the batteries did die... And they did not. Uh, they did not light back up until after landing, which looks to be the case. Um, if they come back at all, if they don't light back up until landing, like we mentioned earlier, earlier in the YouTube broadcast, early on, uh, the the system takes a really long time to get a GPS signal, and. Um, it's very finicky on being out in the open and pointed up in order to get that GPS signal. So some of the testing that, that we did a couple of weeks ago with the system trying to get a GPS signal is if you were under heavy tree cover or inside or if it was upside down, it would, it, it would either get a really weak GPS signal or usually no GPS signal at all. And so then it would... Um, you know, so if it landed and the batteries fired up and came back on, it might start transmitting again, but it would transmit a latitude and longitude of zero zero, and we would have we wouldn't know we wouldn't know where it is. So uh, that that's going to be the major issue if it if it is the batteries and the batteries light back up again. The question is, will it be able to get a GPS signal? I mean, the good news is if it did light up, I and I was close enough to it, I could get the signal and at least see that it was alive. I just wouldn't know where it was. I would know that I was close, which may or may not help me. Um, so I don't know. 
that's kind of what I'm counting on at the moment is seeing if maybe something lights up and I see it um, and then I know I'm close to it. So, how fast would it have fallen enough to bury it in, in snow instead of landing on top? Um, well, it's t that is one thing that's a little bit tough to say because this parachute was experimental. It should land on top of the snow. I don't think it's going to bury itself in the snow if it, if it just came down. Um, because the question really was, gonna, was, would the payload land too slowly and drift forever? Um, so I don't know the answer to that as to whether or not it would have drifted too slowly. Um, but it would have, uh, it, generally we aim for a landing speed of about 10 miles per hour, but I was expecting this payload to land uh, slower than that so that it was it probably come down at maybe five miles per hour. Um, and that's really the touchdown speed that we look at that, um, you know, the upper at, in the upper atmosphere, when it starts coming down, it's, it's coming down really fast, like 150 miles per hour, 130, 150 miles per hour. It starts out at when it starts coming down uh, and then it slows down. And, you know, as it gets into thicker and thicker atmosphere, then when it hits the ground, it's about a, it, I was estimating five to 10 miles per hour when it hit the ground. So that was, that's the thought there. Um, so uh, yeah, it should land on top of the, on top of the snow. It's also got a bright green and orange parachute. So, you know, somebody, especially against the snow, if it's in somebody's yard, then they, they would potentially see this bright green and orange parachute sitting in their yard or up in a tree or something like that. So it's, at least the parachute is highly visible. Um, but then you got to remember that it's freezing cold outside and with no, no end in sight for winter, uh, you know, people aren't going to be outside that much until the snow starts to melt. So it could be a couple days or even a couple weeks before somebody even notices that this thing is outside if, they're, if they don't even go outside for a couple weeks. So. So, yeah, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, somehow I got myself lost. I really have no idea where I am right now. I'm in a neighborhood. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to stop for a minute. I'm in a neighborhood of roughly the area we expected landing. I just don't, I don't really know. Uh, I, I don't know how to get out of this neighborhood. <laughs> uh, anybody behind me? No. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can figure out where I am. Oh, all right, so that way is a dead end. I guess I gotta go this direction. All right. That calculates to around a two hour descent. Yeah, it's, well, it's tough to calculate the actual descent um, because it's not go, it's definitely not descending at five to 10 miles per hour during the entire flight. Um, so you start off the first, uh, until it hits about 40,000 feet, it's falling at like 130 miles per hour. And then it gradually drops from 130 to five uh, as it gets closer to the ground. But it doesn't, it doesn't get down to that five or 10 miles per hour until it's like 1,000 feet above ground level. Um, before that, it's dropping faster and faster. So it's a, it's a bit of a law. If you ever, if you look at on our website at some of the descent speeds graphs that we've posted, I'm trying to remember what flight we might have posted those on, but we've posted descent speed graphs on some of our other flights, and uh, it looks like a logarithmic, or I guess it's the other direction. Um, it's a logarithmic logarithmic chart of descent speed. So it starts out really, really super fast and then gradually tapers off. Um, so it, it can be tough to dis uh, calculate descent time since it's uh, not a static number there. It's a variable. Uh, there are some websites that will do that. And I plan on, uh, on one of our prediction websites, I wanted to drive around first and at least see if I could hear any chirps. Uh, but one of our prediction rep websites will let me, I can go back and maybe update the prediction 
to show the actual burst altitude. And then I may, uh, might give me a rough idea on where it landed. Um, if I can uh, kind of track that down. But yeah, as of right now, it's not looking good. So I haven't heard any APRS chirps uh, while I was out driving around. Obviously, nobody, no other stations have heard it either. And at this point, it's been on the ground for probably uh, getting close to an hour now. So, so um, I guess we're going to chalk this one up as a lost payload, at least at the moment. Still a chance maybe somebody finds it. I'm hopeful. Um, but no word yet which is unfortunate, so. All right, well, I suppose, uh, yeah, I've really covered all these areas here. I'm kind of just driving around. I was looking to see, this is kind of the rough area that we expected landing. Um, but I don't see any, or I don't hear anything. I'm not really expecting to see anything because that's like looking for a needle in a haystack. But uh, I was hoping to at least hear some of the radio signals, possibly, uh, if I got close enough to it. But I'm not hearing anything. I also went up on a really, really tall hill, just in case maybe that gave me a, gave me a better signal. But I'm getting nothing. That chirp that you might be hearing, that's my car chirping. So that's, uh, that's not the balloon. So... So, uh, well, I mean, this was an experimental payload. We certainly knew this was a possibility. Um, I didn't think it would happen the way that it actually did happen. Um, you know, I would have expected, if it failed, I was expecting it to fail either right after launch or failing at those really super cold temperatures that were around like 30,000 feet. But it made it through those did hit some super cold temperatures right right at balloon burst but um so i mean that's still a possibility i just wasn't uh expecting that but we did mention it on the broadcast that during the descent it would get really cold again could possibly kill those batteries um so yeah at the moment looks like we've got no no word from hashtag space shrimp Hashtag space shrimp got eaten by uh, hashtag space, what do we say, octopus, something like that, uh -huh. to stick with the, uh, stick with the maritime theme, the oceanic theme. Um, sorry, I got to drive my car. Probably shouldn't be broadcasting while I'm driving the car, but I am pretty much just talking and watching the road, I'm trying not to look at you all as I look at you. Um, I do have my microphone on so you can actually hear hear pretty well. But um, Yeah, so no word on it. Haven't heard any chirps uh, and kind of drove around the expected landing area to see if I and if anything came up and I got nothing so far. So at this point I'm pretty much out of ideas. Probably going to pack it in and head home hope that maybe somebody calls and says hey we found this uh this thing with a parachute can you come get it um that would be kind of nice but like i said i wouldn't necessarily expect a call like that uh right away being that it's cold it's evening probably somebody's probably not gonna find it today probably not even tomorrow maybe somebody comes out on the weekend takes a look at it you know takes a look around their yard and sees something something strange so maybe somebody finds it over the weekend but it could be weeks or months even before somebody finds it the good news is at least the uh the area that we landed in is not super like underpopulated like overlook horizon one like that that could be years before somebody finds overlook horizon one that was the first flight that we did that is also lost never been heard from again that was two years ago um still haven't heard from about that flight um, but that one could be years because that landing zone was so far in the deep woods that nobody's going there. You're never going to see somebody there. 
Um, so it could be years before somebody finds that one. But this one was landing in a pretty, I don't know, relatively populous area. You know, it's no like New York City or even Rochester for that matter, but it's a in, it's not even in the middle of the city of Canandaigua, but it is on the outskirts in the town of Canandaigua, which has, it has a decent amount of people. Um, so it shouldn't be, the landing shouldn't be in a completely remote area, but if it did land in one of these, uh, you know, wooded areas uh, somewhere where somebody doesn't go very often, then it could be, might be, might not be till summertime for somebody to find it, so... So that's where we stand right now. Looks like uh, we got no no word on our balloon for today. Um, so we're gonna chalk this one up as a lost flight, which is a shame because it was it was doing so well up until that point. It seemed to be working perfectly up until the balloon burst. But on the other hand, though. The fact that it worked up until balloon burst and we have like a definitive finite event that caused the failure, uh, that kind of helps out with design guidelines going forward. Um, you know, it's, it's when it fails in the middle of the flight with no real reason. You know, those are the strange ones and the hard ones to try to solve because there's you're like, well, what happened? What, what happened at, at that spot that would cause it to fail? At least we know this happened at balloon burst. We know balloon burst can be pretty a pretty violent event, so you know that uh, that antenna certainly could have. You know, it's just a little. Uh, what is it like? 20, 20 gauge wire. So it's, uh, is it twenty? Yeah, I think it's twenty or twenty two gauge wire. It's pretty thin wire. So it's certainly possible that that wiggled around so much that it just snapped off. Um, and that would, that would cause a failure like we saw. Um, possible that the batteries just had a rapid freeze during the descent. Uh, so that could be possible. So well, that's kind of, kind of what we're looking at here. So, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'm pulling, uh, pulling back up here. Uh, I'm done with my chase. I got nothing nothing to show for it here at least but we did get a lot of good data during the ascent and we did get all the way up to balloon burst so one thing that we will be able to look at which is kind of cool is all the data similar to what the weather service collects because the national weather service when the balloon breaks their computers turn off they don't even track it anymore they stop they stop tracking the flight and they just let it they let it fall and they don't even keep track of where it falls so they just they let it go out there and they let it fall and they're, you know they're done with it but they they track right up until right up until balloon burst uh, balloon burst and then at balloon burst they shut their computers off and they say all right see you later so we kind of had the same data here um, similar to what they would have so we've got all the data for temperature humidity pressure all the way up to balloon burst and then uh, we've got our balloon burst and we don't know what happened after that so that's like I said, pretty much the same as what the weather service has. So, uh, unfortunately for us, that's not what we planned. It was, it was. If you were watching the bro the earlier broadcast, the launch broadcast, it is something that we plan to do. At some point, we plan to actually launch this micro payload and not even try to get it back. But this one was close enough that we really wanted to try to get this one back. Um, so, but we didn't. Um, but not a huge issue the good news is with this micro payload is the, the micro payload is much less expensive than the big payload so losing this one although it's a a bummer and it's a very unsatisfying ending to this flight it's not a huge issue um at least cost wise we can rebuild it again already got all the parts to build another one um we can we can rebuild it again and do it pretty quickly and inexpensively and easily um, so that uh, that's a plus with this little micro payload is we lost it it's like it's kind of like yeah we wanted to get that one back but not really a huge issue we'll just build another one and then we'll try it again so we'll probably try it again i'd like to try it again in a hurry to see if we can see if we can make this work because as i mentioned in some of the, the pre-launch stuff we want to use this as a, a backup tracker on on our our big flights the ones that are expensive um 
if we lose those. So we uh, I really want to get this micro uh, micro payload to actually work. Uh, I was hoping that, that we'd put this up first flight and we'd be piece of cake, work fine. And it looked like we were on track to do that too, but not so much. So, <clears throat> so let's see, Carrie, what a letdown. Yeah, I agree. It's always a letdown, especially if the tracking system doesn't work. Uh, hashtag space octopus eight hashtag space shrimp. Sorry to hear. Thanks for sharing the experience. I'm now interested in contacting a local ballooning team for our scouts. Yeah, see, and that's what it's all about. It's the, it's about the experience. Yeah, it's definitely a super bummer. But I got more stories about, uh, about failed recoveries than I, you know, that are just as interesting as the successful recoveries. So, uh, so the experience is what it's all about. And uh, you know, we're not, we're definitely not going to, uh, not going to end here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep at it, and we'll we'll get another one up. We've got a lot more. Uh, we've got the bigger flights that we're gonna do the spring and summer. We've got more smaller flights that we're gonna try to do. Um, probably try to do one as soon as possible to see if we can sort this out and get this whatever happened fixed. Um, and yeah, it was just a bummer that uh, that we didn't get this one back. But it's out there. If you're in the Canandaigua area. Uh, well, really, it's like the area between Canada and Farmington. If you're in that area, take a look in your backyard. See if you see a green and orange, par green and orange parachute somewhere or in your tree. Um, yeah, we'll hope to hear from somebody. I don't know. I guess that's it. Um, yeah, pretty unsatisfying ending. I hate ending like that because really, it's you don't get to put the put the period or the exclamation point at the end of the day and say, "There we go, we did it." Um, it's just kind of, well, that's done. <laughs> We're done. So, so that's it. These things happen. Fortunately, space is hard, but that's the fun part of it is it, uh, it keeps it interesting. I guess if everything worked perfectly every single time, it would get pretty boring. Uh, just doing it over and over again perfectly. So the, uh, the imperfections is what keeps it interesting and, uh, it still doesn't sting any less, but it keeps it interesting Keep, it gives us uh, something to something to strive for for future flights. So, anyways, uh, there's my uh, my rant and my it's like my self pep talk, right? I'm just we're we're gonna keep at it. So, anyways, I guess that's it. I'm done uh, done for today. Overlook Horizon 10. That mission is uh, over now. At least uh, the primary mission here. If we hear anything, we will definitely let you know. Um, but uh, nothing heard so far. If anything comes up, we will absolutely be uh, get right on the horn, and we'll post it on the uh, post it on Twitter and Facebook right away once we hear something. If we hear something, but nothing so far. So appreciate everybody following along. Thanks for the encouragement. Thanks for the kind words. Sorry that uh, we couldn't actually end this one with a proper ending, um, but this uh, this happens. And uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to leave it at that, I suppose. So thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, if you got more questions or comments, definitely shoot them, uh, shoot them down below in the comments section. I'll take a look at them a little bit later and definitely respond to any that I missed during the broadcast. And uh, we'll, we'll update you guys uh, at some point, hopefully, if we get it back. If not, then the next thing will be the next flight. So keep an eye on our uh, Twitter and Facebook, and we'll uh, update you when the next one will be. All right. Thanks, guys. Everybody have a good rest of the day. Take care.